I'm never sure if this is actually on or not. Okay, if everyone could come in and take a seat. All right. So if everyone can come in and take a seat, we have our last panel. And following, following this panel, we do have a reception that actually will serve alcohol, <laughs> if that's any motivation <laughs> for you all to stay. So I know people are still kind of dribbling in, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a really, this is our biggest panel of the day as well. So we're going to hear it from a lot of really great voices. Um, I've been mentioning all day where we are not reading bios because we have them all in the packet, but with one exception, we had um, Matt Futch, um, a good friend uh, from NREL, had a medical emergency. Um, so I'm going to mispronounce it again. <laughs> Irfan Ibrahim. Close. Close? Okay, good. good um, is joining us. So when, when you start out speaking, maybe you can tell us a bit just about what you do so there's some, some knowledge about that. Um, and so I'm going to quickly introduce everyone and, and let them get started. So we're being led today by Professor Sharon Jacobs. Uh, we have Sonia Agarwal, who um, we're really excited to have here from San Francisco area, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Baker, who uh, used to be of Colorado, now in San Francisco also, is with Hewlett. And you're with Innovation Partners? Energy Innovation. Energy Innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matt Baker's at Hewlett Foundation. Mark Detsky is, is the local attorney. Uh, Dietz and Davis, and Irfan, and Enrel, and Jeff Ling is an old friend. We first met when we when we were um, both working for Governor Ritter. He's still working for former Governor Ritter at the Center for New Energy Economy. So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the challenges and opportunities in our energy and electricity systems. And uh, I know there's a lot to talk about, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, I'd like to nominate this panel for best dressed of the day, or at least most coordinated. I've never <laughs> met Sonia, but apparently we have a psychic linkage going on. Um, this panel, um, uh, I'm very excited to present to you. We were given the modest charge of discussing challenges and opportunities in our energy slash electricity systems uh, in an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and, and yet, given the expertise uh, that we have at this table, I think we have a fighting chance of covering, if not uh, every challenge and opportunity we face in this industry, at least uh, some of the crucial ones. And we've decided, uh, as have many of the panels today, to run this panel a little bit differently from your classic panel presentation uh, in order to facilitate an organic conversation among the panelists and ultimately, hopefully, with the audience, you the audience as well. Um, so rather than going down the panel and offering remarks to tee us off, we're going to break up the discussion into several large topic areas with a few uh, subtopics that I will tee up. And each of our panelists has agreed to speak for a few minutes to lead off one or more of those topics or subtopics, after which we're going to give the other panelists an opportunity to, uh, to respond, chime in, ask questions of their fellow panelists, um, and get a dialogue going. Um, one disclaimer, we may not hit each and every advertised topic in the panel description, so if you'd like your money back, this is a good time to ask. Uh, however, I think we'll probably hit a number of additional topics that weren't in that description, so I'm confident uh, that you all will come out ahead. Um, and we're going to start the panel off with an overview of some of the key uh, challenges facing the industry today before we get into opportunities, including this question of coal retirements, uh, which is a significant question in the West right now. Um, some have projected upwards of 700 and 570, I'm sorry, coal units either have retired across the nation or will retire uh, by 2030, the Valmont plant just east of here on Arapahoe uh, being one example that will be shuttering its coal-fired unit next year. Uh, and uh, given that about 30% of U.S. utility-scale electricity is currently uh, coming from coal-fired power plants, um, these requirements or these shutdowns rather will have enormous implications for our energy mix, our energy future. Um, and it's not the only seismic shift, of course, that's happening right now in the electricity sector. So for more, uh, I will turn things over to Mark Detsky, a Colorado Law alum and a partner at Deetha and Davis. Mark. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the great uh, speakers that have come before today. Uh, we've had some really great panels. It's been great to see. Um, to set the context, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the successes that we've had. 
And the successes that we've had breed, if you will, the challenges that we are now facing. So when I look back to when I got started in this business, uh, working for Matt, uh, 2004, when we passed Amendment 37 in Colorado, when we had a wind plant online that was about 160 megawatts, maybe we had 200 megawatts roughly total in the state. Uh, that's about just a little over a decade ago after that was first implemented. We had just wrapped up the latest resource plan for Excel Energy in Colorado, where they are making a study to see if they can get to 4.5 to 6 gigawatts here in the next decade. And so that's a scale that was literally un unimaginable in 2004, that we would be here in this, at this day talking about this. So as I got started in my career and when I was in law school, we were talking about the coming transition to renewable energy and alternative energy. And what would that mean? What would that look like? And I submit to everyone here that we are there. We are there in 2017. We are in the middle of the transition. This is it. This is what it looks like. And so the question that we're in struggling with now is, since we've had all this success, how do we build upon it and what comes next? And I think that some of the conversations you hear are, are about that. Is it when you're talking about distributed energy, when you're talking about transmission, where, are the, where, where will the industry turn next? Where will the policies turn next? And I looked up a couple of small stats to share with you all to kind of set this context because the other thing that we worked on 10 years ago uh, in Colorado was the first energy efficiency standard legislation. Uh, a bill to re-up that is in, is in the state legislature right now. And in that respect, we are looking at about flat to 1% low growth of electric energy in Colorado. At the same time, our economic growth is well beyond that. And I looked up the stats nationwide. Last year, we had net generation, January 2017, January 2016, down 2.2%. Economic growth up somewhere between 1.5 to 3 percent, depending on what factors you're using. CO2 emissions overall down in the electric sector 1.7 percent. With so the, if you do the net economic carbon intensity, you have 3.3 percent decrease carbon intensity of our electric sector while our economy is growing. So what I submit to you is that we. It, Earlier this morning, I heard Sarah Krakoff talk about this, the ship turning slowly. And so when I, talk, when I think about what are the policy challenges, I think about that as a separate category from what is the reality. And the reality is, in the West, 14 gigawatts of coal retirement teed up in the next 10 years. And that amount of growth in renewable energy at the same time. So the shift that we are seeing, that we are in the midst of, is something that we are trying to deal with right now. And any policies that may come, on, come down from on high in the short term, we won't, those, I submit to you, will have very little effect here on this last panel. This is the, the least amount of, that we have to worry about as far as what are the policy changes going to affect what's already in the pipeline, the transition that is already underway. Uh, and I'll stop there. Great, thank you. And now I'll open it up to the rest of the panel if they want to, to add to this picture of the challenges facing the industry. So I think that was a, a wonderful opener there, Mark. And I've been thinking a lot about you know what, what a difference a decade makes and how far Colorado has come in a decade and how far the West may actually go in the next decade. And we spent the better part of December, January, and February, uh, looking at data. Sort of a, a lonely cause, but um, looking at data and modeling that the Western Electricity Coordinating Council um, had put together for the next 10 years, the 2026 common case. And what the WEC finds, based upon uh, business as usual assumptions for our Western utilities, is that by 2026, so just less than another decade ahead, 50% of our electricity will come from zero emitting resources. Half of that is hydro. But a lot of it's new wind and new solar. Less than 20% of the, 
of the electricity generated in the West will come from fossil steam coal. So that's business as usual assumptions. And I've, I've thought about this in the context of 20 years, a megawatt or two of solar in Colorado on the grid in 2004, 2005 to 50% of our electricity in the Western US coming from zero emitting resources. And all of the various technological and policy and economic stresses, good or bad, that come with that. It really does seem, looking at the data, that we're in for another really interesting 10 years here. I might, so, oh, go ahead. So I look at this <laughs> intensity of carbon coming down, and I start thinking why. And a lot of it is just swapping out coal with natural gas. The problem with natural gas is it may not be a dance partner till the end of the song even. And the reason why I say that is even though it's an indigenous source, it's just a matter of how soon double hull ships can be formed to carry this out of our country. And you'll see doubling, if not tripling, of the price. 93% of the operating cost of a natural gas unit is the fuel. So if you have price volatility, we're enjoying a really low price right now. What's going to happen to the cost of renewable energy if natural gas is its dance partner? Or the alternative is lithium-ion type batteries that can be quite expensive at scale. So we have a little respite right now. Everything seems to be working in our favor. Energy efficiency is happening. Natural gas prices are low. We're moving to a very services-oriented industry so that we can show economic growth without manufacturing too much. Perfect little respite, but very temporary. And that's part of National Renewable Energy Lab's charter to be the designated driver in this situation and use a systems engineering approach to saying, what happens at 20%, 30%, 40% renewable? while keeping the grid safe and reliable. And I think we're going to find many new innovations are needed in the way the grid is designed, in the way we do business process, and in the policies that incent utilities to invest in these new technologies to stabilize the grid. So that's my opening salvo. Um, just a Thinking about the challenges in particular, um, I feel like this foreshadows the policy conversation a bit. But um, you know, as uh, we talk about renewables becoming a larger share of the electricity mix, and we're talking about natural gas being available right now, but um, perhaps not the resource that we want to rely on uh, to balance renewables solely for the long term, um, we also are facing this challenge, which is looking at all of the possible types of resources that can provide flexibility on the electricity system. Um, and right now, there are some, uh, I would argue, there's a great deal of latent flexibility available in the electricity system that isn't being tapped. And that points us very directly to policy and the utility business model and wholesale power market design issues, um, as well as um, sort of how to expose the value of that latent flexibility in our system so that we can begin to pay for it and begin to build those markets that we know we will need in the longer term to balance a more variable supply sector. So what, what do I mean in particular there? It's, it's not just um, storage. Uh, but it is balancing the grid over wider areas with more diverse portfolios of different types of resources that have different availability profiles. Wind here in Colorado has a different profile than wind in California, for example. And so trading with our neighbors can really help. Demand response is a huge opportunity. Um, we like to say that there is a, uh, already millions of batteries installed in the United States, and they're all of our buildings. Because as, you know, to the extent that our HVAC systems are electrically powered, we can do a lot of riding through um, on that thermal energy and, and, and actually making demand more flexible. Um, 
Then, of course, there's fast ramping natural gas and um, storage, which has come down in price already 90% in the last five years or so. And we expect that the trajectory will continue, um, perhaps not at that rapid pace, but, um, but it is coming down very quickly. So we have lots of options for flexibility. We have latent flexibility in the system. But our challenge right now is how to figure out um, how to better use IT and better use all of our capabilities in the policy realm and in the markets realm to draw out that flexibility. And that, would you like to make a comment here before well, we pivot? Yeah, I just, I just, just really quick. Um, uh, I, I, um, my, I guess my main point is the policies that have gotten us where we are today, mostly around things like the RPS, have done a great job in lowering the levelized cost of energy for wind and solar, and that's been enormously important. The challenges moving forward, I think, are the ones that Sonia outlined, is then how do you build a system around those uh, resources? Um, and th that's a different, those are, those are different challenges, and I think a different set of uh, uh, policy outcomes. The thing I also want to get at and bring out here is just because, you know, it's kind of what, what Hewlett focuses on is, the driver for all of this in our mind is climate. Um, and if, the, you know, if we're going to be in a world that seeks to make an under two degree, you know, have an under two degree footprint, um, then we have to move an awful lot faster than we have, now, than we have to date. And we have to be thinking of you know, how do we have a decarbonized grid uh, in the industrialized world somewhere around 2040 to 2050? How do we electrify lots of things? And what then are the policies that then drive it to here, drive it there? So I, one of my presumptions is you, you know, you, the driver for what we're going to be doing is going to have to be climate. Um, and we have to put, that, put it through that, that prism. And let me just ask the, jump in and ask the panel a question based on your last comment there. Um, the extent to which each of you think that the uh, policy of decarbonization is still driving uh, changes that we see in the electricity sector uh, and in the grid. And obviously, we've had some changes of administration in Washington, uh, different messages now coming out of the administration than we had in the last administration on climate policies. Um, do you see a shift in response to that change uh, in the industry, in the states, uh, in the utilities, and elsewhere? Or do you think that this decarbonization is going to continue to be a driver of the way that we make energy policy? So I think just the narrative needs to be changed a little bit to adjust to the new realities. But the systems engineering approach to solving the problem does not change. What we need to do is widen our narrative from just decarbonization to talking about sustainability. When the manufacturing of solar panels, the manufacturing of batteries, the manuf and the transportation and the implementation involves use of group three and group five gases and rare earth metals. Okay, when the percentages are small, that's fine. But as we go up in the percentage of renewable energy, we need to start thinking of a complete supply chain and include recycling so that those rare earth metals and the gases and everything are used wisely so that we don't have a place where the manufacturing cost starts coming down because of economies of scale but then the raw material costs makes it start going up again. We don't want that. That's not sustainable, even though it'll lead to more decarbonization. But we need to have a more systemic view. In the current administration, the idea of local job creation, economic st stimulus, you can still get the decarbonization, but you just have to change the narrative a little bit, widen it. And I think we are there. We are at the top of one S-curve, as you mentioned, with the RPS targets and stuff. We have achieved that. We can show scientifically and engineering-wise that we can deliver. Now we need to widen the story so that we're more inclusive and can actually survive the long run. Because ultimately, as we go into the latter part of this century, I mean, right now about 60% of non-hydro carbon-free energy is coming from nuclear power. You never heard that number before. About 60% of non-hydro carbon-free electricity in the U.S. comes from nuclear power. These no. plants, a lot of them... Counting, are, counting hydro. No, yeah. not, not counting hydro. I think it's counting. 
60% of all non-carbon resource comes from nuclear. Okay, so I stand corrected. <laughs> but it's pretty large fraction. So we need to start thinking that by 2030 and beyond, as the current fleet retires, what is replacing that? There's a certain amount of inertia that you need in the system for overall stability. You can play some things with plans, marketing, and information technology, but remember, every person who walks a tightrope with a rod will tell you once in their career they fell. And that is the case with every actively controlled network. There's something beautiful about just putting electrons on wires and letting them go. And they figure out where to go. When you have this two-way system and you have an actively controlled, you have to understand and start creating zones in which you manage the stability of the grid. If you don't, then if there's a break in the information technology infrastructure, the repercussions are catastrophic. Still, the, from an economics perspective, don't dispute anything that you just said, except for what Matt disputed. Um, <laughs> well, I said it was bigger. Nuclear it's bigger, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> still, the cheapest uh, kilowatt hour is the one that's not generated. So we, if we start from that, that premise and we look at the overall growth of the grid, then we find ourselves looking at a situation where, and this is where you get tying into the utility business model, things start to break down because we are, we are still living in a system where the economics were such that you invest lots of capital. That capital goes into your rate basis utility. You're allowed to earn your return on that. That's the source the overwhelming source of your income is a utility. From there, when, especially as you get into smaller utilities, when you try to save energy and do distributed energy, and then you are not generating energy, so you are making achievements insofar as your carbon intensity, but you are doing that at the expense of your revenue, and so then you are hurting the revenue stream of, of the utility providing it, you have the situation where the two come into conflict from an economics basis. And that's another challenge that we've been dealing, we've seen across the country, is so where is, the, where is the revenue going to come from in order to make the investments when, if you're trying to decarbonize fast as you can, the best way to do that is not, not to build that next plant, not to invest that next capital resource in generation. And so here in Colorado, where you get into the resource plan and you, you see, well, we have enough natural gas. The load growth is not such that we are needing the next peaking plant based on what we have in the system. So there are opportunities then sort of sneak out from underneath as to where the next capital is going to be invested from the utilities perspective. And then from the consumer's perspective, it's trying to keep a lid on those costs all of a sudden. So you have different motivations where, where you are pushing down on one piece, another piece is popping up, and that is, the, that is a challenge from a, from a regulatory perspective uh, as well as from the engineering perspective. So unless anyone has more thoughts to offer on that, I want to pick up on something um, that Sonia said um, and that Matt followed up on this idea of, uh, of building out. Now we're, we're focused now on the system and on new aspects of the system. Um, and, and perhaps like uh, uh, Dr. Erfan Ibrahim, who I should also introduce since he's not in your program. Um, Dr. Ibrahim is uh, with us from NREL, and he is the uh, director of the Cyber Physical System Security and Resilience uh, Department. Is that right? Uh, and we're so pleased that he could join us at the last minute. And, and in, in light of your position at Enrol and your expertise, I was wondering if you could share with us a few thoughts specifically about some of the cybersecurity challenges that are going to be facing us as we increasingly rely on, uh, on IP systems within our electricity grid. Okay. So here I'm going to mention how when you get on a plane and the flight attendant says, in the event of an emergency, first relax. And then you know, put on your mask, then you put on the mask of your designated child that you think is going to take care of you when you get older, and then your spouse, <laughs> namely your husband. So that's typically the order in which they put the mask. So I'm going to be that person for you today. And this will be very rare, so just remember this panel session. I'll be one of the very few people in this field who will tell you that the problem is manageable. 
because I'm not trying to seek dollars from you to explain to you how we'll solve it. So what they do is they create the fear that, oh my God, it's so unsafe. And by the way, if you pay me, I will tell you how to secure it. So I'm going to break that model for you right now. The main thing is that we have relied on a model with very few producers of electricity. There were well-established organizations with highly developed networking groups, cybersecurity group, and so on, power systems people. Paradigm shift occurs. A lot of independent power producers join. There is no central body to regulate the cybersecurity aspect of these IPPs. NERC doesn't want anything to do with it because they are at transmission and bulk generation level. The state utilities, the public utility commissions are focused on investor-owned utilities. Many of the renewable assets are not coming under that category. They're buying electricity from someone else and then putting it on the wire. The independent power producers are pretty much self-governing at this point. They will have some protocol for how they exchange telemetry data with an independent service operator like a Cal ISO or MISO or ERCOT. But that's about it, how they run their insides. So this is what's leading to the hysteria that, oh my God, suddenly there are so many new attack surfaces. Every distributed energy resource could be a pivot point for attacking. But there is a systems engineering approach to solving cybersecurity. And at a high level, some of it involves network hygiene. And these are principles that we have demonstrated at NREL, and it works. The second has to do with certain technologies of intrusion detection and inline blocking that you can lay on the network. And the third one is a business process that don't move data if there's no need. Quiet down your network, segment the network. And when data moves from one segment to another, find out what the reason is. If there's no reason, there's no need to move. So we have been the worst enemies of ourselves we have become intoxicated with Moore's Law. Moore's Law says that the processing speed doubles every 18 months and the memory price drops by 50% every 18 months. And for many years, this has been the rule, which is why Silicon Valley is booming with $4,000 apartments right now, right? $5,000 apartments. But the problem with that is it creates a cybersecurity challenge because we have started creating highly centralized architectures for data movement because we want to crunch in the cloud. When you do that, a hacker can also run all the way up to the top and cause you trouble. So we are our own worst enemy. And what I'm suggesting is that we have demonstrated architectures that actually work. And I'll be happy to share our work with anyone who's interested. So I would say the problem is solvable, but it requires first to remove the intoxication of Moore's Law and come back to the old school of give information on a need basis. And you really reduce the threat vectors. I have to say the challenges portion of this panel has given me a lot more confidence. There's more optimism here than I, I necessarily would have expected, and I think that's a good thing. You know, one of the things that people often talk about when they talk about optimism are technological solutions. And in fact, we heard in the, the Oxford style debate last night on whether the US should remain uh, part of the Paris Agreement, uh, the position articulated that in fact, uh, the, we don't need to do so much now because that we, will have, we may have available in the future the technological means to lift ourselves out of any predicament in which we currently find ourselves. Uh, can you, can the panel uh, talk about, maybe led uh, by Irfan, but, but, but anyone else on the panel who wants to join in now, um, some of the, the technological solutions, some of the technological innovations and developments that we see on the horizon that could be game changers in the electricity industry over the next 10, 15, 20, 50 years? Yeah. So one <laughs> major technological change is the reduction in the form factor of sensors. Sensor technology has really improved in the last 10 years, I would say, primarily because of Moore's Law. So this is the good side of Moore's Law. And what it has done is the cost has come down, the energy footprint of the sensors have come down, and if you connect them with networks and move information about 
physical phenomena, electromagnetic <laughs> phenomena, you know, like solar storms, which are becoming more frequent, geomagnetic disturbance, you know, electromagnetic pulse type situations, and then physical that lead to cyber. So someone physically comes in, has access to, to systems, and then launches attacks. So I see good use of sensor technology as helping reduce the labor required to have situational awareness. And that we can bring this into an information platform and we can set business rules and when they're violated, set alarms. As opposed to getting alarms from a bunch of devices at the end level and then being overwhelmed by them and shutting them all off. So we have the ability now to move to a different type of situational awareness which will have positive implications on security where a combination of sensors, informatics, business analytics, and then, of course, human in the loop. Matt? I, I, I can't emphasize enough. I think the revolution in solar that's happened over the last 10 years is, is huge and, and will continue to grow. I, I think you will see dispatchable solar um, or the, you know, the, 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 uh, in the future. I think that'll be really big. I also think the utilization of carbon will be a huge um, uh, game changer uh, if it happens, or, or when it happens, I should say. Um, I'm, I happen to be very bullish on carbon capture and storage. I think you need to use it for industrial purposes, and I'm pretty sure you'll probably use it for at least some in the electricity uh, sector. But I also think the real places where we want to see innovation and where we need to see the most innovation is not necessarily technological, but kind of institutional. Like all of our institutions, we're uh, around the electricity sector or you know, basically 100 years old. And so we need to repurpose things that can be repurposed. We need uh, uh, you know, create new markets. These are business models. Um, you know, and these are even ways that we, we think about uh, uh, you know, electricity. So those are the, I think if we solve the institutional issues, um, that would be the biggest source of innovation that we could uh, uh, pass on. Just to add on that, um, it seems that the um, amazing cost declines for zero carbon energy resources over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so um, is just something of a marvel that is not, uh, we shouldn't um, skip over that one. Um, but I think at this point, um, to me, the kind of really exciting thing that will be a game changer is more on the grid integration end of things. So it's all about how you make the systems work together in a more dynamic way, how you can um, dispatch demand in the same way that you dispatch supply, how you can use power electronics to perform all kinds of grid services that previously had to be performed by certain types of generation technologies. So there's all of these new kind of smaller innovations that together form this new way that we can begin to manage our grid that is much, much more dynamic and taking advantage of, of that whole system's perspective that um, before we just perhaps didn't have as much of a need to take advantage of since we had a smaller number of large centralized generators uh, pushing power to end use customers in one direction. Joe? Yeah, I think Matt really hit the nail on the head. I think the need for innovation is much less technological and so much more institutional. You know, something fascinating happened last year while we were all, you know, um, sidetracked by the election. Uh, emissions from mobile sources, cars, for the first time since 1979, eclipsed emissions from point sources, power plants in the U.S. So the, the power plant sector is going down from a carbon perspective, and that's certainly true in Colorado. But the transportation industry is going the other direction. So that is our next big challenge. And there's a really fascinating report that I recommend you all take a look at by the Brattle Group, simply titled, and maybe some of the panelists had a role in it, simply titled Electrification, where they look at the opportunity to electrify transportation and space heating, which are the two big end uses that are sort of remaining to tackle that are going the wrong direction. And they look at technical potential, so it's sort of much bigger than we could ever get, maybe economically or even programmatically. But they say, let's, let's just take an assumption here that all of our transportation is electrified and all of our space heating is electrified through heat pumps and other technology. 
They predict that by 2050, utilities could double their sales. And in doing so, again, because the, the utility sector is, is decarbonizing, we would reduce the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 70%. So there's this double whammy effect. I, I've been trying to say that utilities could be heroes in this future. But those new markets are significant. And I would say that there's a significant regulatory burden of proof for the utilities to come forward to their public utilities commissions and say, we want to electrify an end use like transportation, to which a PUC or a, a, a rate payer advocate may say, what's the need? People are getting around just fine in their electric vehicle. Why do we have to do this? Uh, but the, the need really is, I think, to think holistically and about what's happening to our public utilities, who we need. These are Fortune 100 companies uh, that, that hire a lot of people and have a, a lot to do with powering our economy. And so really thinking about where are the new markets for utilities, PV, solar PV, and other load defection things that are happening, like what's happening in Nevada with the casinos leaving the NV energy system, are all going to put downward pressure on the utilities' growth rate. Uh, I think the annual energy outlook is like 0.6% per year through 2050 for utilities, which is a really, really small annual growth rate. And, and their assumptions on photovoltaics are actually quite conservative. If you look at more aggressive assumptions on photovoltaics, like the Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, projections, 50,000 megawatts of PV by 2022, again, that puts more downward pressure on utilities. I realize I'm asking you to make a leap to think about you know, helping utilities make money, but, and this isn't to try to think about how to feather their nest, but it's really to think about what is the next big institutional challenge. And I think it's that sector, transportation and space heating, again, that we need to bring into the fold and think differently about serving them through renewable sources. Matt, and then Erfan. Yeah, just one point on markets at something earlier, and you had mentioned utilities in the past. And I think it's important to look at one function that utilities play is basically financing the grid. Uh, under any scenario, whether you're a high DG or a you know, high utility scale or big nuclear or whatever it is, we're going to be investing a lot more money into the actual grid itself. And particularly distributed grid is we're going to require much more, you know, much more infrastructure and therefore much more financing. So if right now that role has been played by the utility, so anytime we're, we're wanting to do something that has a smaller role for the utilities, we've got to be asking ourselves on whose balance sheets are these infrastructure improvements going to happen if we want to keep a high quality grid. That's not to say it should be utilities or it shouldn't be utilities, but that question of finance is critical. So a couple of things. One, I agree with you that any kind of process, if moved from chemical base to an electrical, is more efficient. We see that in water purification. We see that in industrial processes. So, and of course, in transportation, the internal combustion engine is not very efficient, as you know. A coal plant actually making electricity produces less carbon than your internal combustion engine. So if you had an EV with coal power, it would produce less carbon because of the eff efficiency or the economies of scale. So definitely, there are opportunities for greater electrification. But we have to be careful how we electrify. I don't know if show of hands of those people who are familiar with the duck curve. Raise your hand. OK. So it's a Chinese delicacy. <laughs> <laughs> the Peking duck curve. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, oh, uh, that's full of carbon, the Peking <laughs> duck curve. Uh, but <laughs> high emissions. High emissions, exactly. But the duck curve actually becomes much worse with two trends. One is the increased dependence on renewable energy, which makes the duck skinnier and skinnier. And then increased electrification in the transportation that causes charging you know, in the evening when the wind is dropping and everyone is turning on their charger. It makes it a lot worse. So then we start relying on these natural gas peaker units. And I already shared with you that it's a very short-term honeymoon uh, with natural gas. So whatever we are designing, let's diversify. 
But I agree in principle that electrification is good. But I think one of the things that we need to look at, and I'm going to be bold enough and bolder to talk about this, okay? It's first, maybe the first time. But small modular nuclear reactors are on the horizon. And they are very different than the big 1.4 gigawatt type of nuclear power plants we have today. So there may be some play in areas where there isn't enough renewable energy and there's need for electrification to start looking at some of those designs. And with time, their cost will come down, they're, they'll be recyclable, you know, they'll be reprocessing, they're naturally safe, they don't have active coolant running through them, they're subterranean. So many of the issues that we have with the nuclear industry, I mean, I'm a nuclear engineer by training, I have a PhD in that field, so I know all the challenges with that industry. But I will tell you that innovation is on the horizon even in that space. So we need to have an all of the above kind of mindset with the idea of decarbonization and sustainability as our force function. And, and Mark, and then I want to, maybe you can all be thinking about this as, as Mark delivers his comments, but um, turn that into a question for the panel, this, this proposal that we, we truly need an all of the above strategy or something like it uh, if we are to meet, for example, goals of deep decarbonization, reliability, other types of goals in the sector, and to see if, if you all agree with that, uh, and so to just be thinking about that. Mark, please. The, the one key word for Murfon, I think, is uh, modular, and that's a, what we're seeing is part of the reason why coal units are being retired, uh, why the newest nuclear unit I read is heading into bankruptcy, um, is that we just don't have the growth or the load to support the scale at which we originally scaled up the grid, which is gigawatt at a time in coal, in hydro, in nuclear. And at least on, the, but I want to tie that into a point that Matt made, which is that it's because of coal and hydropower that we have our grid. That before that, when utilities, to go way back, when they developed, they developed around pockets of wealth and population density. And where there was not that, they didn't go. And so because of that, we developed things called rural co-ops, and we developed things called municipal utilities, where because those people, no one would serve them. And so they had to serve themselves. And then they had to figure out a way to get those people power. So two things happened. The Rural Electrification Act, which built uh, high voltage power lines out to those areas, and where those people got together and formed generation transmission associations, other kinds of cooperatives, to build large coal plants. And then we had federal government uh, developing large hydropower. That was all far away from the load, as well as the coal mines, also far away from the load. And therefore, the transmission developed to serve, to have the hydropower and the coal power deliver their power to market. And that is the same grid that we have today at least in Colorado, with almost no change. In some areas of the country, mostly the ones that have moved to the regional transmission kinds of markets, you have seen where there's a third, a new force being applied to utilities in terms of how you're going to grow the grid, that you see some new high voltage power lines. And sometimes you even have uh, third party transmission companies, non-utilities, that have gotten into the transmission line business with mixed results. But when you talk about financing the grid, it was the mostly the federal government that financed the grid as we have it today, through the Rural Electrification Act and through the development of hydropower. So utilities have not been in a position where they need to finance large scale grid additions. And mostly they don't want to because that changes things and utilities don't like change very much. And so, when, that's one challenge I, I want to talk about in terms of where does transmission go from here. What, the pressure, at least, especially in non-RTO areas on how transmission is going to expand uh, is a huge question because it's, you know, these are billion dollar plus projects sometimes, although they usually come in under budget, uh, especially when you have utilities that are coordinating, but you also have balkanized utilities, especially in the West, 
where some are regulated, some are not. And to get those groups all to get together to build new transmission to enable big grid additions, so far we have not been able to crack that nut here. So that's one challenge. Another challenge I want to talk about is on the distribution level. And on the distribution level, that also really hasn't changed much in 50 years. And right now, what, we're see what I am seeing personally is a rush of mostly companies that are, can be described as kind of in the startup space, um, but they have technology, they have ideas, the technology can be scaled up, but at least it starts small and can be attached to things like substations and feeders and localized transmission lines, and they all think that their technology is the answer. And they are all, and some of them are saying, let's deregulate so that we can get our products in there. Some of them are saying, let's you know, somehow bypass the utility in a regulated context. And then, the, and then thirdly, you get the utility saying, wait a second, wait a second. I, we have the idea. We're going to do this distribution project. And at no point has anyone, has, have all of them come together in a reasonable manner to say, here are all the options we have on the table. Here is the state of our distribution grid. How can we deploy these in some way where they can make sense, where we can have standard formats, where we can have these, we don't have duplicative technologies. And I think that that is kind of creating a little bit of a log jam that I see as a challenge. And how do you, how do you deploy those technologies, get the utility buy-in, with the regulators buying as well and, and move forward, as opposed to um, hurl forward into the future and then say, okay, what did we just do? And I want to come back to the uh, governance structures and utility rate design in just a minute, um, but, but just sort of to wrap up the, the current uh, section of our discussion, uh, this question of, 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 of where we focus, right? So we hear about new natural gas as a bridge fuel. We hear in New York State now about nuclear and maintaining their nuclear plants as a, a bridge to a renewable economy. We hear about renewables as a source of energy in the future. We hear about demand side resources and reducing demand. Um, but is, is, are we looking at slices of a larger picture? And are we going to have to, to some extent, rely on all of these solutions, all of these sources uh, as we move forward? Mark, you, uh, you want to start? In the, or, sorry, Irfan? Matt, and then Irfan? No, you Jeff? go. Jeff? Well, I don't know. Jump in. Yeah. <laughs> you all could think about what the real answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that yes, direction. we need everything. I, th I think folks that have really studied this issue would generally agree. Um, I'm an engineer stuck in the lawyer's world, and I, I tend to think that our, there's no limit to our ingenuity when it comes to engineering the grid. You know, the question comes down to things like trust. You know, if you, if you really look at the Western ISO conversations that's happening between the East, the West Coast and the mountain states, what that really comes down to is trust. Do states trust one another to manage a grid regionally? Uh, there's a great quote by a utility CEO. We did this convening before the clean power plan was even a thing, and we got utility CEOs and their CFOs together, and one of the takeaway quotes was that technology is 10 years ahead of utilities, but utilities are 10 years ahead of their regulators. And that's not a, a slight at any current or former commissioners <laughs> who are the exceptions, <laughs> truly. Uh, but it's a, it's a fact. And In Colorado, we're ahead. We need to take a hard look at, at our regulatory models. How it's, it's about financing. It's about deploying limited capital to the highest, best use. Mark's totally right. There are umpteen vendors who have a, so a solution and and if you would just you know flip to PowerPoint slide number 40 you'll see that um, and I don't and he's right about that those technologies exist so we need to align the model to allow utilities to sort of compete some of those technologies mm -hmm. may the best company may the best technology win not every technology is going to become cost-effective but some of these technologies really do hold the promise to reduce costs for ratepayers. And the problem is that the regulatory model is not aligned for utilities to invest in risk. They're extremely risk averse because they follow the money, and, and so they should. And so how do we do that? How do we take some money out of the public trust, blend it with private capital, blend it with, with shareholder dollars to invest in these new technologies? That's not an engineering problem. Yeah. That's, that's a regulatory policy problem. So first of all, the electric utility industry is not a monolith. 
You know, we always talk in generic terms, the utility industry. When you actually know them, and I know about 50, 60 CIOs of major utilities across this country personally, the culture is so different from one utility to the next, depending on their geography, what their customers want. They are a business. They're in the business of selling electrons and making money. So I wouldn't say they have a specific ideology that you could say safely applies to all of them. So having said that, technology, there's plenty coming in, in informatics, communications, power systems, there's no shortage. But what's lacking are case studies, scenarios of how, what business models do we want? So we swing from one extreme, which is highly centralized architecture, to this almost chaotic situation where even a guy on an exercise bike is connected to the grid, delivering two watts of power. One there, watt. One watt? <laughs> <laughs> must be pedaling Sky. slow. <laughs> <laughs> Intermittent source, you know. So you, have to, you have to stop for the Twinkies, you know. Uh, so, it's fuel. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have this mental models of one end or the other. I think really the future belongs somewhere in the middle where there is some centralized generation coming as a shock absorber. And then you have zones of self-sufficiency with renewable energy, with demand response, and so that the customer behavior is following the supply of the electricity, so you don't have to put too much storage, you don't need lots of peaker units. But that needs to be worked out. So teams of people across the country need to say, this is how it will be under normal circumstances, and if a hurricane came through or a tornado came through, then we'll move to this option so that we don't have this 11th hour. I mean, if there's anything we've learned from Katrina and Sandy and all of these, is that these plans were not in place. And it took them weeks to restore electricity. If the grid had been networked a little differently, there were plenty of places that had electricity, but they were not allowed to deliver electricity on that grid. So these kinds of exercises need to be done during good times. And I think that it's more about business process and building consensus on how to work rather than building new tools. I think we have plenty of technologies. The issue is the integration and scenarios, decision tree models. I, I, you mentioned a principle, you didn't use this word, but I think the, I, the concept of robustness yeah. has to be built into everything. And um, you know, I, I consider myself uh, somebody who believes that the future very much will be wind and solar. Um, but also not necessarily somebody who would bet the planet just on one particular solution. So I, I, I think, you know, using kind of a, a, a robustness framework, I, you know, I think it's really important wherever possible to keep all of the zero carbon resources that we have on the grid running um, until we know that there's something that can replace them or will replace them that is going to be zero carbon. So they're like the last, last things that, that we want to go. I think we have to be full speed on deployment of the resources that are cost effective right now. A lot of wind and solar, that, that's uh, important. And I think we need to be doing the systems, information, markets, things to try to integrate those in as possible. I also would put CCS as something that I actually think is deployable right now. Um, there are plants in Texas, there are plants in Canada, there are a number of plants in China um, that are working economically at this point, so we need to be putting uh, resources into those. And then finally, let's just innovate on a broad scale of uh, things, uh, nuclear um, or you know, fourth generation nuclear, um, batteries, uh, dispatchable solar, um, deep geothermal, all of those things. We've just got to be moving uh, on all cylinders on all fronts um, and, not, and hedge our bets wherever possible because sometimes we may end up at a dead end. And you know, in electricity, 80% decarbonization is not enough. Um, particularly, uh, and 80% and decarbonization in a way that's fairly expensive in China and India don't want to do it is also not enough. So, um, you know, we, we, we have a responsibility and an ability to be both an example uh, and an innovator. So a, a, a broad consensus that seems to be emerging here is this idea that um, technologically we can get to where we need to go provided we have the right 
regulatory incentives, provided we have the right business structures, the right governance system. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about that. And I'd like uh, for Sonia to lead us off, if you would, to talk about whether it's possible. Uh, uh, you had uh, you have some optimistic language that we've been chatting about this idea that it's possible to hit the trifecta of clean, affordable, and reliable power if we look at shifting uh, some of our policies and some of our governance structures. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So. Um, just a little bit of context. I know we've also been talking about some of the challenges and innovations and opportunities. So I just uh, think this is one of the most crazy times in the electricity sector that we've seen in, I don't know, um, many decades. Uh, because very recently, say in the last two years or so, we've reached the crossover point where building new wind and sometimes solar uh, generation is actually less expensive than the marginal cost of continuing to run some old coal plants. So that's not true across the board everywhere. That's not true it, you know, for each, each, each instance. But we are starting to see actually the economic forces at play here where we could replace some of that marginal coal, that old coal, with new renewables and actually save money for customers right now. So that's, that's kind of a really crazy time to be in the electricity sector because it means there's going to be market forces um, moving in the direction of decarbonization and, and doing so relatively quickly. I know earlier today, Senator Udall made a comment that um, market forces are sometimes much more powerful than uh, the president or more powerful than uh, policymakers. But um, I suppose I would um, say that policymakers still have a major role to play in setting the table for um, an institutional makeup that will help accelerate us in the direction that we know we need to go. But even more so than just, okay, you know, can we create the institutional structure to move um, us faster toward these zero carbon resources that, that will end up being cheaper. But also, how do you make sure that the transition remains really affordable for um, people and for businesses and also um, make sure that this transition, which will be quite a large technological transition, happens in a way that um, is reliable and resilient and robust in the, in the ways that have been talked about on this panel. So on that note, um, thinking about policy, first off, I just wondered, um, I know lots of folks raised their hand when um, we mentioned the duck curve earlier. So I was curious how many people actually work in elect the electricity sector or in electricity policy? OK. That's great. And it sounds like lots of um, knowledge on uh, electricity policy issues, if you guys are so familiar with the duck curve. so. Um, I guess I'll just start by saying um, the utility business model has been mentioned a few times here on this panel. Um, and it was really developed uh, you know, alongside that beginning of the grid. And we heard a great history of how some of that came together um, <clears throat> around uh, making utilities very efficient deployers of capital to build infrastructure. Um, and that was a huge service that we needed um, as we built out the grid over the last century or so. Um, we needed that low cost source of capital to build infrastructure. So, you know, in regulating these monopoly utilities, um, regulators looked for ways to um, offer a fair profit for investment in uh, infrastructure. So that's kind of the way that um, the utility revenue structure has been uh, had been created to help us get to the point where we are now um, with universal service for folks in the United States uh, with uh, electricity available at all times of the day that's pretty reliable and pretty affordable if you consider um, what an amazing uh, resource it really is. Um, but now, as we are moving into this time of transition with lots of new technologies that we actually do want to um, push onto the grid faster, um, we need to uh, be very focused on uh, delivering a clean electricity system affordably and reliably. And it isn't so much about incenting additional um, infrastructure uh, build out in every case. 
because um, we've talked also about a lot of energy efficiency causing load to be relatively flat for uh, quite a long runway here. So at the same time as load is relatively flat, aside from some electrification opportunities, um, we have to transform the way that we're making our electricity and we have to add all these new capabilities to the grid to manage these new resources in new ways. So um, we've argued that uh, moving toward a performance-based regulatory structure makes a lot of sense for utilities. Um, and what does that mean? It means that instead of only offering the utility a profit opportunity every time it makes an infrastructure investment, um, you focus on outcomes that can be measurable um, in the categories of clean, reliable, and affordable and then begin to move some of the utility's profit incentive to align with achieving those outcomes. So instead of the only profit incentive being around building infrastructure, it's moving some of the profit incentive to also align with um, measurable outcomes in the categories of clean, affordable, and reliable. So some folks have attempted this. Um, the most, uh, the example with the largest runway uh, so far has been in the UK, um, and the interim results of their performance-based regulation uh, uh, program recently came out, and it's really pretty amazing. The utilities, um, you know, some utilities have done better than others under this, uh, under this uh, rubric, as you would kind of expect. Uh, but a lot of them have really cut their operational expenses, which, you know, in the prior revenue paradigm is a pass through to customers. In the new revenue paradigm, it would be, um, there would be incentives to reduce those operational expenses. And that unlocks some, some capital that the utilities can then use to help make investments and innovate in a way to reduce, um, reduce the environmental impacts of their system at the same time as they, they um, maintain reliability. So that's one, <laughs> the utility business model, some reforms to the utility revenue structure. That's, that's kind of some of the, um, uh, the framework in which you can cause um, investments in the utility sector to land more often on the green choices than the brown choices. Then in the regions that have um, deregulated their generation, uh, so wholesale market regions, um, right now those uh, wholesale markets are often designed around um, the same sort of uh, old paradigm of very large power generation stations sending power in one direction and, and essentially looking across the, the options and finding which ones will be the least cost in, in, a, in an hour by hour basis. Um, there are some changes also to the structures of those wholesale markets that can um, begin to expose the value of grid flexibility and begin to pay new kinds of resources for providing services on the electricity system. So that, that again is sort of trying to um, realign those investments to make sure that the money is landing in a place that will um, draw out the, the, that latent value that today is, is not being captured in the electricity sector. So I suppose before I go on for too long, um, there are definitely some enabling policies that um, will be important as well. Um, around transmission, which we heard some about, um, around um, expanding the trading between different regions. Even if transmission exists, sometimes we don't do a very good job um, trading uh, electricity across wider regions. Um, electrification will require a whole other set of, um, of policies and then also um, just uh, bringing it all together, kind of thinking about setting long-term targets and enabling um, those actors who are, who are capable of financing these new um, technologies and who are capable of meeting these overall societal outcomes to have a clear path of where, where the whole system is going. So some thoughts on policies. Terrific, thank you. Um, and for any panelists who would like to follow up on the business models idea. I, I just wanted to follow up on the performance-based incentive. Um, in Colorado, the way the one 
area that I've seen that be successful is in the area of demand side management. And we have a performance based incentive where there's two different parallel kinds of incentives, one being what sort of is characterized as an offset for the revenue that may have, that the utility has lost its incentive to pursue. And that's one set, and then another set for actually achieving energy efficiency reductions. And that was put in place, uh, I think maybe by uh, Commissioner Baker and others, in, in, in part because you have that dichotomy of we are encouraging you to not sell your product as much best as you can. And so I think that that, at least from the Colorado regulatory perspective, is an exportable model that takes a large chunk of that, of that utility incentive pie and puts it into a performance-based category. The only issue is it's probably not enough of a profit margin for the utility overall mm -hmm. based on their, compared to their rate base where it totally moves the needle. They're, they are still kept underground in a small chamber where they are occasionally the executives <laughs> open the door and ask how everything is and then close it. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, I think that, is, that has been an excess, success. And I just wanted to contrast that where you have uh, big locational nodal markets in the RTOs and the, and the East. And you know, demand response has had some trouble as far as getting into those markets at, at, the, at the FERC level. Uh, but another interesting thing that's happened in, over the last year is in the Ohio context where coal plants could no longer compete at those mo locational market nodes. And what happened was the utility went to the regulator and said, please uh, allow us to either, you know, one way fail, they went back for another way, but the, the overall message is please make your ratepayers pay for these coal plants because we don't know what to do with them. <laughs> And so the, on the one hand, that's a, that's a good step in the decarbonization world. But on the flip side of that coin, geothermal, nuclear, the full suite of these technologies, they can't compete either. And so in that respect, you have solar, wind. If demand response can figure out a way to be in those markets on a more permanent basis, then I think that demand response can compete in those markets, or it has, has shown that it can. So, um, but then now here in the West, where we don't have a market, we have two dynamics. One, we have these uh, depreciation of coal plants uh, that the utilities have over many decades. And they're, so they don't have to compete. They're just baked in. Uh, and so what do you do with that? Well, and then at the same time, the utilities now in the markets have, in the West, we've created these uh, market-like substances. Uh, one of them is called the imbalance market. Another one being formed is the Mountain West Group. They are, they are both uh, have market category, uh, aspects to them, but they are not actual markets, or at least utilities are resisting a move to create actual markets for many of the same reasons. Once that has to happen, then these old fossil units will be unable to compete, and these utilities may be in the same position that they see their brethren in, uh, uh, in the eastern markets. At the same time, this, this market competition is all uh, based, at least from what I can see from the outside looking in, on how to best get to California and how to leverage the incredible issues that California is having, but also to get in there and, and leverage those financial opportunities. And so uh, I just wanted to make those points. One, on the, and the, 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 if you're moving to a market structure for utility business model reasons, that could very much encourage renewables, but at the expense of innovation. And then on the other side, the, on the performance base, that's definitely shown to, I have seen it work on a small scale, but my question is, how does it scale up? So a couple of observations. So as we move from this highly centralized architecture to the distributed generation model, I think we're going to see, and this is like a crystal ball about future, that it won't swing all the way to the end where every home is trading and doing that kind of, because it's too chaotic. I think they're going to form groups. They're going to be like regions, what I call zones of autonomous behaviors. And they'll have an arrangement by which they exchange energy with informatics so that they can improve the reliability. See, the issue here is 
when you have the grid with lots of excess capacity, you had built-in reliability into that. Not much happened to the wire unless, you know, a tornado went through. But when you move to the distributed generation model, if you don't have good business process, reliability is one of the first victims. Because of the intermittency, you may not have all the resources to absorb the intermittency. So there is a larger group, and I think of like a 1,000 to 1,500 people kind of grouping that will have enough diversity in their energy sources that they can be a serious player in the energy market. And if that happens, then the utility that we know today will become a wires company, a very important wires company. But do you see the problem with that? In the current policy, the, the infrastructure cost is being put on fewer and fewer kilowatt hours. So the infrastructure cost is going up if you look on your bills. That's not a sustainable model. So this has to move to something like a 911 or a fire department or a police department where some amount of money is given to them just to keep that wire going. Why? Because sometimes we'll need to use it, just like sometimes you need that fire brigade, sometimes you need that police. We're not very close to that yet because the utilities think they're in some kind of downward spiral and they're doing, they're fighting all they can to survive in this market. But I think at the policy level, the assurance needs to be given to them saying, you'll be safe, you'll be doing something different. And this model comes from the telco industry. Look at regional Bell operating companies. What happened to them when the deregulation <laughs> happened after 1982? They literally became wires company and they were charged an access charge to connect you to your home. Today, even that's gone. They've brought fiber to the house, and I don't know what has happened to the regional Bell operating company. To become three companies. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of consolidation. So we have some sneak previews of coming attractions in this space, but I think that it's a mistake to think about microgrids just at the edge. I consider the entire electric system as a mosaic of microgrids, not just at the edge. And in the middle, it's not so much about load as it, as it is about electricity entering and leaving that zone. But that wisdom of maintaining stability in that zone is there. And with high-speed informatics and communication, we can achieve that. Some people talk about it as the fractal grid. But fractal sounds a little chaotic. This is a little more <laughs> coordinated. And its purpose is to build reliability and also resilience. Resilience against what? Natural events. Happening more and more often with greater impact. If you don't break up like that, you're now again dependent on that transmission line. If it went down, you're out of commission. And I don't think we're taking the best advantage of technological innovation yet because some of these policy impediments are there not to move into that fractal method. And what does that, just quickly, and we'll get to Jeff, what does that do to resource planning? So when you have all these, um, and this is for you again, Irfan, if you have this mosaic of microgrids, what does that do to the utilities resource planning to the extent that they're still doing any of that? What does that 911 backup fire system, police system look like in terms of capacity? Well, I think it freaks utilities out, frankly. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of challenges there. But what was interesting, I was listening to all four of you talk, Different, theme, different policies on the same theme of moving away from revenue from volumetric sales. I mean, I think there's a lot of common ground there. And I think a lot of utilities feel they need to move away from that. More of a service model, more customer choice, a lot of sort of uh, uh, standard services depend, you know, that, are, that you pay depending upon how much you use. Um, but I mean, I'm, an, I'm an incrementalist, so I think about policies like a peak RPS which is gaining some traction right now. You know, there's legislation in Arizona and in California to really align renewable mandates with, with the most expensive time of power generation, which happens to be usually in the summer, usually in the afternoon. In Colorado, it's almost always the second week of July that power is, is really expensive because we have a shortage. So peak RPS is sort of emerging. Corporate purchasing is significant, and I think the statistic is by 2025 with existing corporate uh, targets, just targets that boardrooms have approved already, uh, 
corporations in America will have to purchase 18 gigawatts of renewables by 2025. So that's, uh, that's an awful lot of new renewable energy. The question there is, though, if you take uh, Coca-Cola, which is one of the companies that signed on to RE100, just take them as an example. This is a commitment to buy 100% renewable energy. They're an international company. And so how would a public utilities commission in a state bring Coca-Cola's interest in buying renewable energy into resource planning for, let's say, Excel Energy. They're, they're a multinational corporation. How much of their procurement has to happen in Colorado in order for them to fulfill that goal? So I tend to think about how we get these different things into the utility resource planning process. And I think that onus is on, that burden of proof is on the, the companies to make that case. You know, and then finally, you know, where does the, where does the, as I like to say, where does the Velcro really touch on transportation and utilities? Utilities are not likely to drive electric, it was not intended to be a pun. <laughs> utilities are not likely to push uh, electric vehicle adoption, but they absolutely want the load. Uh, and so uh, they're not likely to completely change their business to accommodate that, but I think there are things around rate design and infrastructure that are really gonna change here. So. I had to get that in. I wouldn't have been doing my job if I didn't answer the policy question on this panel. So I just want to add that hydrogen coming to a theater near you as a link between electricity and transportation. And if you visit us at NREL, you can see a lot of good work happening. So instead of depending on lithium ion batteries, when you have excess renewable energy, you make hydrogen. And then you can use that as a fuel to make electricity when you need it or you can use it as fuel on vehicles. And we have an incredible research program at NREL looking, it's kind of like your grandpa's Buick. Now the new Bu Buick looks nothing like it. Our concept of hydrogen is dated, but the new Buick is out now. <laughs> I, I, agree, I agree with Jeff on the, on the incrementalist. I think that that's also what I've seen in my career, uh, such as it is, has been incrementalism in the end is what happens. Um, and I think that's because the, of what we are, have not talked about here today, which is the pressure of rates and the pressure of politics and the pressure of other kinds of institutional mechanisms in our regulatory structure that really prevent big changes. And sometimes that's been for the good and sometimes that's not as fast as we'd like, but I think in the end, incrementalism tends to be the default. And so, I think that when you are pursuing incrementalist strategies and you can find consensus around those, you find that over time, you have moved the ball very far. And I think that uh, current wind and solar penetration is uh, the example of that. When you're looking at close to four gigawatts of installed renewable capacity in a little over a decade in Colorado, that is done by an incrementalist policy. First, it was the uh, renewable energy standard but also it was minor tweaks in how we structure the util utility modeling exercises, which is a black box of a morass that we did go way down to the weeds on, on in uh, PUC proceedings. But those little tweaks that make one resource win over another add up to what, to what we have today, which is one of the cleanest grids in the country. And so I think that as much as I would want to be a prognosticator to say in 50 years you're going to see the absence of regulatory structures in a deregulated environment where hundreds of small companies are competing to sell you small widgets that will then communicate with the utility and turn the whole thing into magic fairy dust. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that it is much more likely that we have big giant conglomerate utilities that are still investing in huge projects um, that are very capital intensive, that have regulatory backing, that are consensus based, but they are living in a world where their old infrastructure is long gone. And so the coal plants have been retired and shut down and decommissioned and turned into various kinds of demonstration projects or community solar gardens or things that are on the margin that are moving the ball and maybe one of those catches fire and becomes uh, and you know, rushes into the picture the way that utility scale solar has now caught up to wind and is likely to surpass it. But I don't, um, the, but as far as 
the major changes, I, I, am, I am with Jeff on the incrementalist vote. Very quickly, if I'm Matt, we'll let you have point. the last word on this topic and transition us into our last I topic. I agree with Mark's concept of incrementalism in this industry until there are some disruptive changes. Some disruptive changes occur because of technological innovation. For instance, the uh, advent of big data and cloud computing. And utilities are actually contemplating moving their SCADA systems to the cloud. Who would have thought, right? But because they have limited IT departments, they can't keep up the pace of innovation. Another one is these large-scale catastrophic natural events and the blowback that the utility gets from the consumer, that can cause step function changes quickly uh, in terms of trying to build more resilience. It's not so much about carbon then, it's about creating self-sufficiency locally in areas. So utilities have to respond. Do you know that as a result of Sandy, LIPA lost their contract in the area that was hit by Sandy, so now PSENG runs that area. I mean, that's huge, but it happens. Matt, if you want to have the, the last word on this topic, then maybe transition us, um, if you would, to the last topic I think we have time for before questions um, from the audience, which is just to spend a few minutes talking about some of the political dynamics here in the form of, of transition and thoughtful transitions. Uh, as, as, as we shift our emphasis from one fuel to another, uh, as we shift the way electricity is provided and who the winners and losers are, uh, in those transitions. Um, how we accomplish that, and I know, Jeff, that you and the recent report that your center has put out um, have some thoughts, too, to offer on that subject. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just go right to that, um, except to say I agree with what everybody said. I, I, although I would say the areas that utilities or will be responsible for are much bigger um, and much more regional, um, and that the roles that regulators have will be extraordinarily important, but probably very different, looking at things like market power, reliability, quality of service, um, maybe ultimately price, but, but maybe not. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, um, uh, you know, President Trump, uh, you know, made an issue out of uh, coal and coal miners, um, and I think ultimately that was almost a more of a cultural uh, uh, play than a, than a, than a, than a specific, um, uh, you know, play towards a group of people who actually work in the mines. But in any event, all over the world we're seeing this, um, and it's and it it's it, and we always see that whenever we're in any kind of transition. Um, you know, the Germany Energy Vende is kind of like very much stalled out. Um, and a lot of it is concern over, uh, you know, uh, miners in the coal mining regions. In China, we're seeing that it's extraordinarily difficult to um, even get the grid to operate on a more economic footing, let alone more renewables, because there's deep concern about how that's going to impact uh, the coal regions of China and the coal provinces of China. The companies happen to be state-owned that own the, own the generating resources. You know, and then we get to see it here. And then if you play out the um, transition even further, you know, just in the U.S., if you think any transition in coal is going to be difficult, think about it in oil and gas, which, I don't know, employs about ten times as many people um, and has, you know, has brings much more wealth to different parts of the country. So the thing I think is important is we need to not necessarily think about what is the optimal way to get to the future, um, because sometimes the optimal way causes frictions that prevent that future from happening. Um, and we need to be thinking about ways to, um, uh, you know, address the value chain of the incumbents uh, in ways so that their, their losses are mitigated as well, whether it's the bondholders and investors or companies or whether it's the communities or workers, uh, you know, and school districts. So I don't really have many answers for it. There are a lot of people who have been doing a lot of work on how do you do that from utilities perspective, so in regulatory proceedings, we can keep the utilities whole, and therefore, in many regards, they're kind of agnostic. At least Excel is in terms of the generation that they have, because it's not it's not necessarily taking it out of their hide. Um, but we need to extend that thinking 
to communities. And I know Jeff has done a lot of thinking and, and energy innovations it really has done a lot as well. So with that, I'll kind of set that up and pass it on. Jeff? Full disclosure, I, I, don't, I will not have any answers at the end of this. We have done some thinking on it, but it's, it's a tough issue. It's a tough issue politically, certainly. And uh, folks tend to take a sudden interest in their shoes when you start talking about transitions for coal communities and, and sort of check out a little bit like that's just going to happen. I don't think it's an if. I don't think it's a when question. Uh, certainly, Washington would have you believe that. I think it's a question of how. Uh, and again, I, I turn back to the data. We were convening 13 western states and 24 utilities to talk about the clean power plant implementation. And, and the, the nutshell takeaway from the modeling that's been done there is that with business as usual assumptions again, with a little bit left to go in 2030, the West assuming trading uh, was in compliance, is in compliance with the clean power plan today, the clean power plan targets. Individual states are not, but if the states traded, they would have been. Uh, by 2030, 45% of the existing coal fleet in the West will be retired. Uh, by 2040, as much as 90%. Uh, only about 10% of the coal capacity in the West, 10% uh, of the coal capacity in the West was built after 1990. So a lot of this, these plants are very, very old. 1960s, 1970s, early 1980s. Um, that 90% number is just so staggering to me, and we've we sort of vetted that with, with folks that do modeling, and, and that's, a, that's about right. That is what they're telling us. That's a massive transition. I know some folks in the room here have, have worked on these issues for a very long time. We're starting to really think about how this is going to impact certain communities. Think about Coal Strip, Montana. Think about Page, Arizona. Think about Craig, Colorado. Um, they all have some similarities. You know, Coal Strip uh, is a very large power plant. Uh, 2,200 megawatts, I believe. Uh, recent announcement by Talon Energy that they want to close it uh, in 2022, an agreement with Puget Sound Energy and Talon, the operator. Then they came out shortly after that to say, in fact, we'd actually like to close it in 2018 because it's not economical today. That's all happened in the last, in the last year. Uh, complicated by the fact that there are five owners of that power plant that are in multiple states who, from what I understand, have a hard time deciding what the agenda is going to be, let alone where they're going to meet or what they're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, Coal Strip, Montana, exists because there's a power plant there, uh, no question. Uh, Page, Arizona, the Navajo Generating Station, similar story. Five, five owners, one of them the Bureau of Rec, the federal government. Uh, 2,300 megawatts, three units, will close in 2019. When SRP bought uh, LADWP's contract a few years ago, they said they'd have that plant open until 2044. The market has changed. The market has shifted. Low-cost natural gas and the advent of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling have, have changed a lot of that. Craig, Colorado, uh, due to regional haze, a settlement has been reached, uh, again, with the five owners. There's a similar theme there. Five owners, multiple states, a little bit smaller power plant, but a big impact to the community. So. If you've, if you, uh, this isn't a book plug, but if you happen to read Governor Ritter's book <laughs> about um, the energy revolution in America, there's a whole chapter devoted to the just transition, what he calls the just transition, and it talks about basically kind of paying it, paying it back, that we owe, we owe coal communities, we owe coal families a great deal of gratitude for electrifying America and making us a superpower, frankly. Uh, and we can repay that debt, not with bluster, but with actual programs. And so we're starting to think about what is the responsibility of utilities who have employed these folks and who have benefited and their shareholders have benefited from these plants. Uh, how many people are needed for reclamation of these sites? There's an awful lot of work that that's, uh, needs to be done to decommission and reclaim a site. Um, how many of these folks are close to retirement? Where are the parallel heavy industries where a prideful transition can happen? Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be just in the energy sector, by the way. Our, our economy is doing quite well, 400,000 new jobs in, in Q1. So it doesn't need to be the solar industry picking up coal jobs, although it could be. Uh, one in 50 new jobs is now in the solar industry. 
These are just questions that we're asking ourselves, but there's absolutely a need to come up with a program, with a model, because there are very, very similar issues across the country, across the West, Southeast. It's the same problem. And we've got to put some ingenuity behind it and get a program together. I, could I, I just want to add something almost in the form of a question. So you have a lot of these jobs in coal plants that tend to be unionized, high paying benefits, um, being replaced by solar insta installation jobs, which may be forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. It's really not a fair, right. you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, 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 it's apples to oranges. Um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in China is, is that they're looking at ways to, uh, again, just take, create revenue streams to help the provinces and the school districts and the hospital districts and things like that, um, you know, accommodate whatever loss of income they may have. I, I would also say that we should also be, you know, we have to be, the problem is carbon, the problem's not coal. So, you know, investing in technologies that have really been underinvested, and I'll come back to CCS as one of them, um, you know, are also part of that promise, uh, uh, I think, um, and, uh, you know, that we need to move forward on. But I didn't add that, so I'm sorry. So, so just one very so, brief comment, and we're going to try to open it up for questions sure. for the audience. So I am very passionate about workforce development in my center. I cross-train people, so networking people learn power systems and vice versa because I see an integrated economy coming where you cannot just be in silos. So I'm very passionate about this concept of the coal community. And I don't think we need to look at this in civilian terms. This is a national security issue. Why do I say that? If you have a large segment of people that had a livelihood and were part of the middle class, and then they are marginalized this way, they end up in, under poverty. And that poverty leads to a lot of urban violence and problems, which then law enforcement needs to come in and deal with. We're also moving from an indigenous source of energy to one that has a supply chain that spans the globe. When you do solar and stuff, panels come from China, you know, and then they get assembled. And so when you have transitions like this, there are national security implications there. And therefore, I would tell the US government, look in your defense budget and appropriate a certain percentage of that budget for rehabilitating these people, because this is a national security issue, just like veterans coming back from the wars. They need to be trained to enter the economy, just like single parents on welfare. Why aren't they getting jobs? Because childcare is too expensive, so they stay on welfare. What's happening, and I've been here in this country for 37 years, we're rapidly moving in a third world country direction. How do I know this? Because I come from a third world country. If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's going to be a duck. Beijing duck. Huh? Yes, and not the duck from the duck curve. <laughs> Different so duck. We, we tend to remain in our little bubbles, but as citizens of this country, we have to think of ourselves as a family. And these types of things are high priority, and I think the narrative around it is incorrect. It needs to be seen as a national security issue and appropriate priority given. So I'll just quickly say that you have to segment the population of the coal community. Some of them can be involved in the decommissioning. Some of them can be given early retirement and then trained on running in data centers or some other new economy job. And even the younger ones can actually be put back in school where they can learn a totally different discipline and move. So there needs to be some segmentation of the community. It's not a monolith. Great. Well, with that, um, we'd like to open it up for the last 10 minutes or so here to the audience to take some audience questions. And I see the first one right up here. All right, I think this is on. Oh, good. Okay. And if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself before asking your uh, question. Certainly, Diana Orff, and I know several of you, uh, as you know, I've worked with the coal industry for a number of years. And I'm, I'm really interested in the last part of your conversation because the communities are a critical issue. Um, I understand the discussion on workforce training, et cetera. My question is, training for what? Those communities without 
tremendous investments in infrastructure have no other industries. If you look at Page, Arizona, if you look at Coal Strip, if you look at Craig, Colorado, there are not the, the transportation infrastructure, there's not the broadband for internet. Um, I think it's going to take a bigger investment, frankly, than, um, than for just the workforce training, and I think we need to think in broader terms. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to say that it, to me it's kind of a unifying theme for the, all the panels that I've heard today. The history of the West is that the West was settled on the basis of exploiting the natural resources. And that's true in, if you look at timber communities, uh, not, not just coal, um, and like Matt said, oil and gas today. Um, that's, how, that's how the West was won. That's how, that's how people, you know, fanned out over the West. And I, I agree with you that it, the, the effort is, what I can tell you is that, so we know one thing. We know that the change is coming. We don't know exactly how fast or, or exactly what for. We just know that it's coming. So then the question becomes, so what kind of investment are we going to put into it, and where does that investment come from? And everyone is going to point the finger at everyone else. Um, but I, ag I agree with you that that's the challenge. And, and I think that it is one of, if, if it's not the, the top clean energy challenge, it, it is among the top. Because there is no, the communities out there also, they, they don't necessarily want what we are offering. Um, and so it, it is a, something that I think needs to be done as a generational investment um, as not, and not something that's done even at, at the same time as we shut them down kind of thing. Okay, we have so, a question here. Well, one one uh, quick response from Erfan yeah. and then we'll take the next question. I think that it's important to look at what information technology can do. There are plenty of jobs in that area where you don't have to be co-located with your boss. And we can look at these types of models. Uh, you mentioned about the lack of internet service providers in the area. Trust me, if the money was there, if there was an opportunity and someone needed networking in like groups, like a couple hundred, these same ISPs can use very innovative technology to give you ISP connection today. You know, we are lit by satellite today all across America, but we don't rely on it for a lot of our ISP communication because the fiber is available in metropolitan areas and it's much cheaper to go that way. But if there are areas that are underserved and there's a business model where a couple hundred people that have been trained in IT jobs can work from their homes, trust me, the ISP will jump and come there very quickly. We see that in the US military. How long does it take to set up a network in forward missions? If that's possible in a war environment, I don't think it's the issue is money. And if we have the appropriate training and these people can work from home, suddenly the Starbucks, the Walmart, the grocery store, everything will start showing up there because they'll have the cash to spend in that area. So I'm not suggesting that they be lo relocated because they may be living there for generations. But it's important to look at some of these more advanced technologies because they give you new working models. And there's a political answer too that, that no one's really talking about is giving huge tax incentives to companies to go into these communities and create jobs where these folks are. And that's happened in, in various um, segments. Like I know um, some textile industries were given massive tax deductions to hire Native Americans. I mean, it's happened before, but this is the perfect example of where that could happen. And, you know, that's a political response that I think in this environment would be probably received pretty well. We have a question over here. Thanks. I'd like to be a contrarian and suggest that what's been missing all day is the low tech, which we most desperately need. High tech will not be financed by people who have no income because food prices have risen a minimum of 30% in real terms within 20 years, which is probably a low estimate. We're not being told this, except in the actual reports on ag and climate change. There are some major assessments. They are easily accessible. What I'd like to suggest is that we consider the fact that the Western coal industry in particular is an example of creating a huge industry based on the premise that we'd all be better off if we busted 
UNW in the East, which was a major purpose of the 1977 Clean Air Act amendments using the so-called low sulfur scam, which was coal should be low sulfur by weight, regardless of the BTU content. There's a lot of backstory to what's happened to the West as a perpetual colony for resource extraction. But what we most desperately need is the restoration of soil and the restoration of vegetative production and agricultural capacities. Those are the basis of watershed, water quality, water retention, and carbon sequestration. We can't think only about high-tech solutions when we live in a low-tech world on which we depend. Thank you so much. I think we'll take that in the spirit of a, a comment in the interest of getting as many comments and questions from the audience as possible. I have one question, and I'll, and I'll bring it over here. Um, I, I'm, I grew up with the Jetsons, you know, cartoon. Um, so what are our houses are going to look like? What's really going to happen with the Tesla wall? How soon will that will be affordable? Mm -hmm. um, assuming that we go to electric cars, you've got net metering, you might have uh, distributed storage. What kind of legislative changes will be needed for utilities to handle those changes that I think will probably happen fairly quickly if the price drops on distributed storage, which we haven't talked about storage too much. Well, I think that when we talk about storage, the narrative is very different on each kind of chemistry. I mean, my study of chemistry and my understanding of the lithium element I, I'm just very concerned about that, even though it puts back a lot of energy per unit volume. But I am very concerned about the blowback of a serious event that causes loss of life. It hasn't happened yet, but it can happen, and I'm concerned about that. So I think that when we talk storage, we need to have a very diversified portfolio, which includes you know, ultra-cap banks, and other types of storage, hydrogen, many other things. I want to make a quick plug for energy efficiency. It, um, despite, uh, I don't know how well insulated the Jetsons home was, but it had a lot of glass. <laughs> it might have been, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, Transparency. And, and I, I still think that when we talk about the high-tech solutions on the capacitors and, uh, and on substation vol voltage and things like that, we also need to keep in mind that how much gain is made when you insulate walls and in an attic space of a home, and and that and how much of that is missing in our current housing stock, and so that could be classified as low tech, but the things that people who are not up to speed on the, on the inner workings of the electricity markets might notice is that their house is really hot in the summer, and that their water heater is broken and that they you know, are, need to get new windows, and that, they, ha and that they're, you know, they want to replace their oven. And that is the concerns of most people who are not you know, too t or tied to our industry. And so when I think about you know, the, what the gains that have been made in, in, at least in Colorado in that space, it's a, it's a lot of those, you know, what, what, what is our light bulb? And that is not very Jetsons-like at all, even though I have a phone jack in my wall that has some purpose. I don't know what it is. Um, but, they, but we have some, some vestiges. But you know, most of our homes are still standing. And they're still kind of boxy. And, they, they don't, you know, and they're old. And they're, they're going to keep being older. Except for in Boulder, everyone's going to pop their top and have an efficient second floor and a low efficient first floor. Alice, I defer to you on this. It looks like we're just about out of time for this panel. So one, one last question, then we can continue the conversation at the reception. Mm -hmm. I just had one question that went back to the coal miners and the families that are displaced in this transition. Um, has anyone gone into those communities to see what they want? I mean, have there been any studies at all to say, okay, if you don't have this job, and, but you still want to stay here, what would you like to see here instead? Yes. So last week on CNN, I saw an article in which some of the community representatives addressed the Trump administration and said, we don't want coal jobs back. We want the advanced technology jobs now. We want the 
tech, the jobs of the new age. What, you know, they use generic terms for it. But so that shows that they are open to doing different things. It's not that they want their coal jobs back. Um, and, but and I think we should to... say that not nearly enough of that has happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. My wife is an urban planner. She works with in, in very urban communities throughout Colorado. And, and she would say the first trip that we, we make, we just, we just listen. We know they're ultimately going to want a bike path someplace, but we, well, we listen. And this is so much more complicated th than that. And, and, but the challenge is, who does that? Where does the funding come from? And, and, uh, and where are the solutions ultimately? Th there are financing programs. There are grant programs. I think we could sort of put something together. But I don't think we really, really know enough about what the communities want. So to the comment of the low tech, uh, I am doing some work at NREL right now in looking at how uh, we can take electricity and decentralized desalination and plasma arc furnaces and put them together for a sustainable planet. I don't know if you know, but 80% of what you put in the recycling bin never makes it to a finished product. It goes into the dump. And the reason is because it doesn't match the recycler's needs. And the problem is chemical-based processes are very limited in being able to separate things out to the elemental parts. So you feel that civic duty to go put it in the recycling bin, but if four-fifths of it is not making it, that means that they're pulling the wool over your eyes and it's 50% cotton. So the plasma arc furnace, <laughs> desalination, <laughs> and energy nexus is very important. I know the previous session was on water. But it's important not to delink water with electricity. They're very, very connected, and it's important for us. So if you're interested, you know, reach out. I'll give you my business card, and we can talk more about it. There's some very innovative things that we can do if we look at the trifecta of the three. Thank you. Well, I want to thank this panel so much. Please join me in thanking the panelists today. Thank you so much. And also a big well thank you to Alice Madden, our new GWC director. We are so happy to have you here, Alice, and thank you for all your work. On this thank you. So your program says concluding remarks. My concluding remarks are let's go have a drink over here. <laughs> Continue the conversation. Thank you very much for being here.